And they said, he'll never get a record deal with a name like Garth. Welcome to another episode of Boarding Curious. I'm your host, Mary Katz. Garth Brooks himself has said if it weren't for today's guest, there probably would be no Garth Brooks. His name is Kent Blasey, and not only has he co-written If Tomorrow Never Comes, Somewhere Other Than the Night, and Ain't Going Down Till the Sun Comes Up, but he is also a 2020 Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame nominee. His latest album is titled Authentic, and today we're going to talk about all of that, the stories behind some of your favorite songs, and Kent will tell us about the importance of being prepared and perseverance. We'll also get to know Kent a little better with some fun personal questions like, what's the worst thing you did as a kid? All righty, let's get started. Well, first of all, thank you so much for, for joining the podcast today. I'm so excited to have you on. I'm having a Beatles moment. I'm like, how do I do this without, you know, ending up having a restraining order against me? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so thank you very much for being on today. Um, get, let's get started by, um, can you just tell me what you wanted to be as a kid? Because most people, you know, wanted to be a firefighter, baseball player, and you became a songwriter. Most people don't have that in their, you know, in their radar. Well, I was one of those kids that dreamed of becoming a baseball player too. And um, my dad had been a a PE uh, teacher and all that stuff. So from an early age, he was throwing the ball to me and having me hit and catch and all that. But we also, we grew up in a little town in upstate New York, um, Woodstock, New York, before it was Woodstock, the pop festival. But even back then, it was a small town, but it had a lot of authors that lived there and, and painters, artists, uh, actors from New York City lived up there sometimes. So as a kid growing up, I met all kinds of people that were creative, that were making a living being creative. And even at an early age, you know, you'd go to somebody's house and they'd say, hey, I just wrote a book. Can I autograph it for you? Or they're working on a huge painting in their living room. And I thought, this is a cool way to make a living. So uh, we moved to Lexington, Kentucky because IBM where my dad worked used to mean I've been moved. And uh, so we moved there and um, you know, it's a totally different world from where we were. But um, so I mainly concentrated on baseball, but I also was writing poetry and stuff like that and got some things published like in the high school books or new uh, yearbooks or papers or whatever, you know, and I thought, well, you know, people must like it enough to want to publish it. And then when I got my guitar, it's like, well, I write poetry. I guess I can write songs. So I handed in my baseball uniform and got a guitar. (laughs) And that was the end of my baseball career. That's awesome. Who's your team? It was the White Sox. I mean, my big, my big sports team. Yes. Uh, New York Yankees because my dad was a huge Yankee fan and so when we would go back and visit to relatives and stuff he would take me to Yankee Stadium and um, so I had to be a Yankee fan. I kind of got out of it when they went on strike in the 1990s. I kind of gave up watching all sports but uh, my wife's kind of gotten me back into uh, sports again so I'm a Yankee fan again. All right. That's awesome. I know at one point you were um, touring um, with, I believe it was a band in Canada. Right, with uh, Ian Tyson yes. was the leader, and he's like the Bob Dylan of Canada or something, right. kind of like Gordon Lightfoot or something, and just a great songwriter, performer, and a big star up there. And so I was playing guitar for him, and he was very helpful with my songwriting, encouraged me to do it. and we had a band that was a Canadian band, but I was kind of the leader of it. So he would let me open the show for like a half an hour playing my songs and then he would get up and do his stuff. So, you know, when somebody who you really look up to as an amazing artist and songwriter gives you encouragement, it just makes you think, wow, you know, this may be possible for me to do. All right. Um, and, and then when you did finally, what was the final push for you to actually go to Nashville and do that? So uh, a friend of mine in Lexington, Kentucky, there was actually a group called Exile and they were a big pop group and then they actually went country. But uh, one of the guys in the band, the bass player, Sonny LaMare was a good friend of mine. And so when I was off the road one week, I went to visit him and he had this new guy in Exile named Mark Gray. 
and Mark was probably one of the best singer songwriters artists I had ever heard in my life. Very soulful. And, um, so Sonny said, well, play, play Mark some of your songs. And I played him some things and he said, well, you need to move to Nashville. And Ian had been telling me the same thing. And, uh, Mark said, well, if you come down there, I'll help you any way I can. I'll introduce you to people. And, and so I thought, well, if these two people believe in me, I'm heading to Nashville. So that was really what pushed me over the edge when it came time to move into Nashville. I've only driven through Nashville, and even that was enough for me to tell my husband, like, we need to move to Nashville. This is beautiful. Like, we didn't even stop. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is a beautiful place. And there's a creativity in the air here that's nowhere else. It's very interesting, you know. It's uh, like I would go write with Garth when he was living in Oklahoma, and he would keep saying, there's just no energy out here. I can't write out here. And I went out there and I'm like, yeah, you're right. We better, we better go back to Nashville to write songs. Yeah. And there's and just uh, some kind of creative energy here that I love. So yeah. come on. Oh gosh, I want to so bad. I want to go to the Bluebird. I want to go to the Opry. I and wanna... you definitely have to see a show at the Ryman. Mm hmm. Absolutely. And if I recall correctly, um, I believe in a prior interview, you had said that you didn't, you got kind of tired of touring. Yeah. Um, you know, Ian was based out of Calgary, Alberta. And so that's pretty, pretty far away for a Kentucky boy. And um, so it's kind of a back and forth thing. And you were away from your friends and your family and stuff. And so I did it probably two years with him. And I just decided I need to concentrate on my songwriting. I've been out on the road for five or six different years with bands. And it's time just to get into Nashville and see what I can do. Mm hmm. And so you moved to Nashville, you're writing, and um, you've written uh, on my uh, the story behind the song list. I have a few here. And so If Tomorrow Never Comes was your first song that, that you heard on the radio, right? No, my first one was, and I was very lucky when I moved to town, I figured it would take four years to have something happen. And in the first year and a half, I had a top five record by a guy in Warner Brothers, Gary Morris. And so that kind of opened the door for my songwriting. And it was kind of the reason that I ended up writing with Garth because I was the only person who'd had a top five record or top 10 record that would write with him. And uh, they were asking different people who had had hit records to write with them. And I was the only one that would do it, I guess. So when you heard um, the, other, the other song before, do you, do you remember the first time you heard that on the radio? And like, is that, that just feels like it'd be like a mind blowing moment. It is a mind blowing thing. Um, it's one of those things where, you know, in most jobs, you can kind of see when you do a job, you're going to like even paint in the house, you know, when you're done, you see you painted the house and it looks good. Uh, in songwriting, you just never know. You keep writing songs and writing songs. And so finally you have one that does something and it's, it's like a miracle. It's like magic to be driving down the road and hear a song that you wrote that you've been working so hard for so many years come out on the radio speakers. That's, that's, I can't, I cannot fathom what that must feel like. But on that note, like you, you write some very emotional songs. So when you're, you know, if you're out at the Bluebird performing or whatever, I, how do you get through those really emotional songs? Because I can't listen to some of them in the car without right. crying, well, let alone. Yeah, there's sometimes I can't get through them. And there's some songs I just don't really perform because I can't sing them without crying. And if tomorrow never comes, sometimes it's the same way to get through that one. But um, there's just some songs I'll sing at home, but I won't sing at the Bluebird because I'll, I won't get through it. Wow. Yeah, I saw Reba in an interview and she was like, I look for the exit signs. And I'm like, I, I, I still can't, I don't even make it to that point to just, I don't know, I can't, I don't see how you guys do it. Well, I call it a pull over to the side of the road moment. And, you know, there used to be a lot of songs on the radio that did that to me in the 90s where you just hear something and you, you know, you start tearing up and it's like, I got to pull over to the side of the road. I yeah. can't, can't drive. Which songs do that for you? Well, a big one for me was Heart of the Matter by Don Henley. Um, the other one was the song Remembers When. Oh, yes. Um, there was a Reba song. I'm trying to think of which one it was that just, I'm, is there life out there? That yep. was another one. There were so many great ones. Ships That Don't Come In was another fabulous one. Um, Walk Away Joe. 
what a great song, you know. And, Absolutely. Uh, there were so many of those that I pulled off or, over to the side of the road a lot in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> One of the reasons I started this this podcast is I'm I'm a huge music fan, and I grew up listening to mostly 90s country. And the songs back then, I feel like, had so much heart, and they had a lot of emotions. They had so much feelings, and they just, you know, they were very relatable. Whereas now I hear more, I guess it's just more easy listening. It's just kind of like it's on. Yeah, yeah. I mean. Do, do you think that's missing from country music now? I really do, and, you know, I don't want to sound like an old fogey, but... Um, you know, you go back to the 60s, 70s, 80s, there were those songs that still get played because they had that emotion, they had that heart. And I just wonder how many of these songs that have come out during Bro Country in the last 10 years are ones that people are going to want to listen to in the future, you know? Are they giving them some kind of emotional support, some healing, uh, some joy? And um, I, I just don't hear it all that much. You know, the one song that did it for me this year was, uh, I think her name is Ingrid, uh, what is it? Michelson or something? Yeah, and yeah. it's called More Hearts Than Mine. Mm -hmm. And that was just such a real song and it was so emotional and so true. And they let the song and the singer speak for themselves. They didn't try to overload the the music or the arrangement or whatever. And uh, it, was, it was the one song this year that made me pull over when I heard it. I was like, oh my God, this is what would be nice to hear a lot more of. Absolutely. That, that is a very, very emotional song. I, it, it gets me all teary too. I'm in yeah. the car with my kids and, and they're like, mom, are you okay? And I'm like, it's, I'm just going to change the station. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. What you do know, you think? Built me was like that too, you know, or mm -hmm. I drive his truck. There were a few in the last few years and I kept hoping it would maybe swing around more, but you know, it's a whole different world than it was in 1990 and in the 90, as far as how many artists there were and how many record labels and, uh, so many people were looking for outside songs back then, and it's not so much these days. They want the writers to be the artist, and I think part of that's missing the real heart of things. And, you know, Garth Brooks is probably one of the best writers there is, but every album he did had half outside songs. Hmm. And, you know, he found things like The Dance and Friends in Low Places that took his career to another level. And I don't think people have really studied that and see what an amazing song can do to your career. And they're out there. I hear them at the Bluebird. I hear them at other writer's rounds, uh, but they don't get recorded these days. And on that note, my next question kind of ties into that. Um, since the start of your career, what are the biggest changes you've seen from the beginning of your career to, to now? Is, would the, we say that's the biggest change? It's just this, the number of songwriters? Yeah, I think uh, probably the... The biggest thing is that the business has shrunken so much. Um, and I think a lot of it happened when we quit selling CDs, because if you and I wrote a song and Tim McGraw recorded it, that was on a CD, when the CD came out and it sold, we would make money. When they went to downloading, if you and I had a song on Tim McGraw's record and it went to downloading and nobody downloaded the song, you wouldn't get paid. And so people tend to download just to hit these days. But now that we've gone to Spotify and those kind of things, the money is so small that publishers can't even pay songwriters to write songs anymore like they did when I came to town. It used to be somebody would sign you to write, and it was kind of like a loan. You would write for them, and they would pay you. And then when the song got to be a hit, you would pay them back. And I just don't see how that would work these days. There's also maybe three or four labels with 20 artists on it compared to back when there were 20 labels and 20 artists and they were all looking for songs. So hmm. that's, that's the biggest change that I see. It's gotten so much smaller. So if, it, if you could change one thing about the industry, what would it be? How much time do you have? We have all the time you want. <laughs> <laughs> I would really like to see uh, songwriters get paid what they're supposed to get paid. And uh, with every new high tech invention that comes along, the money keeps getting more and more scarce. You know, like you, you could have a song all about the bass, which was a big Megan Tra Trainer song. I think it had 50 million hits and the songwriter on the song told me he made $4,000. You know, so imagine I had a song that was a 
probably top 15 song on a Sony artist. And it was about a dad dying, a, a girl that did it. And I guess daughters told other daughters about it and whatever. And so one night I'm on YouTube and I, it comes across my screen and it's got 12 million hits. And I've never had anything that got 12 million hits. And so I called my administrator and I said, well, what does this pay? And she said, well, I'll get back to you. She called the next day and said, that'll probably be like $300. How is that possible? So, I don't understand the pay structure because you would think that more streams, more hits would equal more pay. Well, it would, but what they're paying per stream compared to what a radio hit would be through BMI or ASCAP is minuscule. It's like less than one tenth wow. of what you would make uh, with a, a radio hit. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, that's what I say. Hmm. What What do you think? is the biggest misconception about either songwriting or the music industry in general? Well, the one thing is people think if you've had one hit, you could retire and you're a multimillionaire. <laughs> I see that all the time with uh, friends of mine who've had hits or, or what people say to, to me or to them. And, you know, that would be nice if that was the case. And it may have been more of the case back in the nineties, but these days you can have a major hit and, you know, it, it may get you through a year if you're lucky. And then if you've mm. had to pay a publisher back or something, you know, and then you got to pay taxes and everything else. So it's, it's not the glamorous life that people think it is. See, and that's, I'm, I'm so glad that you're saying that because I think a lot of people have a glamorized view of the music industry and they think that they're going to, you know, move to Nashville or Atlanta or wherever and, and, you know, hit it big. And it's just not the same as it was, even though, more songs are getting played if that right. really makes sense yeah i mean that's true and i see you know the people that i was working with in the 80s and 90s it wasn't about they all wanted to write a hit song but more when you were in a room they were trying to get the heart and the emotion of a song and um it wasn't about the fame and it wasn't about the money and these days it seems like there's a lot more people that are interested in the fame and the money and the acknowledgement rather than heartfelt songs that are going to change people's worlds. Hmm. I can see that. Um, so is there anyone in the industry that you haven't worked with yet, but you really want to? I would love to write with Jason Isbell. Okay. He's, a, he's an amazing guitar player, singer, songwriter. It would just be fun to hang out with him and see what we could create together. Um, I love writing with people that are great electric guitar players because that's my main passion other than songwriting is playing electric guitar and it would be fun to see what we could come up with. Awesome. Well, why have, you haven't called them? <laughs> uh, no, you know, it's, it's, it used to be where you could get in touch with people pretty easy in the eighties and nineties, but anymore, there's just so many people around the artists themselves that even people I know it's really hard to get to people you've wow. written a number one song with that you can't get to anymore. It's just uh, the way the world is these days. Okay. Hmm. Times are changing. Bob Dylan said that 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to that song, it's as relevant today as it was 60 years ago. The times they are changing. Mm -hmm. All right. Kent, moving on to the story behind the song. Let's give mm -hmm. it a, let's uh, start with if tomorrow never comes. All right, so this is my favorite story and it may take a while, but um, so in Nashville, when you're trying to make a living, you have what they call all the irons in the fire. And so I was playing in a band, I was doing studio work, I was writing songs during the day and I kind of saw where the business was going. So I started my own little demo company. And um, so I can play a lot of instruments. And so I would, do demos for other writers and do uh, ones for myself. But when I moved to Nashville, I would take my songs around and people would go, well, I like that song, but who the hell's singing that? And I'd always made my living being the lead singer in a band. And so I was kind of surprised, but then I realized the caliber of the singers that are in this town. And so when I started my studio, I started trying to get the best singers to sing. And I had like Billy Dean and Faith Hill, Martina McBride, Joe Diffie, 
um, Trisha Yearwood, all these people sang demos for me because they couldn't get a record deal. And it was just so crazy. I'd be like you with my headphones on listening to Joe Diffie come through my headphones. And I'm like, how can you not sign this person? And Trisha Yearwood, she was like my favorite female singer. You know, I would put her on everything because she was just like the most phenomenal voice. And it's like, how can she not get a record deal? So anyway, because of all that, uh, Bob Doyle, who was Garth's manager, knew I had a demo studio and Garth was cleaning churches and selling boots. And he knew he could make more money singing demos. So they came over and they played me some songs. And I said, I'll be glad to use you. And he quickly became my favorite guy demo singer because he could sing anything. But when they were leaving that day, Bob says, well, Garth writes a little bit too. And so I said, well, yeah, let's get together and write a song. And so the first song that we sat down to write together was If Tomorrow Never Comes. And Garth had brought this idea in. And I remember sitting on the couch and he was standing up above me and he walked through the door and he said, I've got this idea that I've run by 25 writers and nobody likes it. And I kind of looked up at him and said, gee, thanks. And he, he kind of got a little testy and he said, well, don't you want to hear it? And I said, yeah, you know, play me what you got. And so he played me what he had and, and he stopped and I said, I really like that idea. It's something that my mother used to tell me, you know, tell the people you love how you feel about them while they're still alive. And so he said, well, what's wrong with it? And I said, well, you're killing off the main hero in the song, like in the first two lines of the song. It's like killing off the hero in a movie in the first three minutes. Where do you go after that? Do you, do you remember the lyrics? That, that, so the original lyrics, do you remember what those were? Well, they ended up kind of being the second verse of the, of the song because I thought it's a good verse, but it doesn't make sense coming in first. So uh, I said to him, well, you know, we need to change that. And he said, well, what would you do? And he says, I spewed out this whole first verse, which may be true because I was looking at the lyric the other day, the original lyric of it, and he wrote the whole first verse out in his handwriting down below the chorus. And he's never written another lyric down that we've ever done on another song. So it must have been true. And so we wrote this song and we thought it was a really great song. Uh, Garth did a little guitar vocal in my studio that day and we pitched it around town for I don't know, maybe a year and nobody was interested in it and nobody was interested in him. They said, he'll never get a record deal with a name like Garth. And uh, so one night he got to play at the Bluebird and sing one song because another artist didn't show up. And somebody from Capitol Records who had passed on Garth for the third time that week heard him sing If Tomorrow Never Comes and said, hey, why don't you come back in? Maybe we missed something. So he went back in the Capitol, got a record deal and um, if Tomorrow Never Comes was his second single and his first number one record. So, wow. uh, you know, from when we wrote it, he was cleaning churches and selling boots. And the next thing you know, he's Garth Brooks. <laughs> you know, I, I, honestly, that song um, is one of the reasons I started this podcast. Because oh. I was, um, you know, COVID hit and we lost Joe Diffie. And right. we lost Charlie Pride. And I'm like, these people that I've admired for my basically my entire life are just like, I, I don't know what's going to happen next. And then I saw Reba in an interview talking about, um, you know, the terrible plane crash that killed, you know, right. like half of her crew. Um, and she in an interview in the interview, she was saying that, you know, if so, if there's something you're wanting to do, you just got to do it. And I was like, well, you know, if Reba says I got to do it. I just got to do it. And um, and I thought and then my next thought was because we, we don't know, you know if tomorrow never comes and like, and I was like, okay, so here we are. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. It's like, appreciate what you have every day and appreciate the people who you love every day. And mm -hmm. you know, nobody's promised another day after that. And Absolutely. I think that's why it resonated with people in the heartland, you know, maybe the people in the music business didn't get it when we were pitching it, but you know, we've gotten so many letters from so many people of how they've used that song so many different ways. And then it's kind of been a hit around the world by another guy, Ronan Keating, who's a, an Irish English artist. And, you know, you can be in Italy and you hear that song come on and you go, wow, here I am in a, in a country, I can't speak the language, but there's my song playing. So it's touched a lot of people. And it's that sentiment that everybody knows, but sometimes you just need to hear it come from somebody. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we all get wrapped up in our day-to-day -day thing and 
it just you know you never realize it until it um till it hits you you know right exactly okay moving on to somewhere other than the night okay so garth and i are a lot alike in that we write, like to write songs from titles and so like him coming in with if tomorrow never comes and so i always have some titles to run by him and he always has some titles to run by me and so that day we got together and neither one of us liked the other person's ideas at all and so that's the most frustrating thing in a songwriting session is when you have two writers or three writers in the room and nobody likes any ideas at all so i had this black labrador uh, that loved to play Frisbee and Garth loved this dog. And he said, let's just go out on the back porch and throw her the Frisbee. And, you know, we can sit out and talk and maybe an idea come or something or something. And so we threw her the Frisbee for like two hours because she just wouldn't give up. And we talked about women in politics and the music business and the state of the world. And so it was getting to be near the end of the day. And I thought, well, we're not going to write a song today. That's cool. And we went back in the house and he picked up a guitar. And he sang a line and I sung a line back to him and he sung a line. I sung a line and I thought, well, we're writing a song. So he wanted it to be about a farmer or a rancher kind of being from Oklahoma who hadn't really been paying enough attention to his wife. And so he's saying, well, you know, we need to get in there. What turns a, a man on when he's coming home from work. And so I hadn't watched Oprah Winfrey. I just heard about this, you know, but uh, she had a show about how to turn your man on when he comes home from work. And uh, the one woman had said, well, I get naked and I wrap myself in cellophane. And I told Garth and went, oh, I don't like that one at all. And I said, yeah, me neither. I said, well, what about standing in the kitchen with nothing but an apron on? And so being a farm boy, he kind of liked that. So that's what ended up getting in if tomorrow never comes. And I think it helped the sale of aprons when the song became a hit because uh, I don't think aprons had been in a song for a long time. So we stuck that in there, but uh, it was just him wanting to get that country rancher feel into the song. And, the, and he thought that really did it. And, you know, at the end of the day, we never dreamed it'd be a, a single, but it ended up being a hit song and same thing, lots of people saying, well, you know, it made me be aware I need to tell my wife more that I love her and, you know, show her that I really care about her. So, you know, that's what you aim to do when you're writing songs is to give people a, an appreciation for what they really have in their life. Yeah, I had my husband listen to that song about three weeks ago because we hadn't been on a date in over a, in about a year. And well, I was, yeah, like, we were just off. going through the day, COVID and everything, just the day to day, trying to, you know, keep everything. We have, we have a four year old, a three year old, and an 18 month old. So it, it's a crazy, it's a zoo in there. I'm in the garage apartment right now and really happy about it. <laughs> I understand. It's a good thing you have a place to go. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So I, I was like, we haven't been on a date in like a, a year. And I'm like, I'm like, listen to this song because we just, we got to, we got to date again. Like it can't just be, we're with kids and then we watch Netflix, like just, mm. and so he, he heard the song and now we've, we've been on three dates. I love it. <laughs> That's kind of what we've been aiming to do on a Friday night. We'll order some food from a different place and get it delivered and have a little date right in the, in the, Mm -hmm. in the den or something you know set up right. a nice table and candles and uh all that nice tablecloth and just make it a date exactly okay and moving on to uh getting you home the black dress song i i just I, i'll tell you i when this song came out and my i was talking to my dad and um he, he he was like what music you listen to these days and i was like you i thought i really like that uh, getting you home song and he's like i didn't need to know that <laughs> That would be a father's response. Yeah. But you know, Hey, you've got kids. What can I say? So that, you know, it's interesting. I work with this kid and I've been working with him for 20 years, Corey Batten in his name. He's a phenomenal singer songwriter and um, great performer. And so we were trying to get him a record deal and we were going through the motions of going to all the record labels. And we came pretty close a couple of times, but we were down at RCA and we were playing his project for this woman and I knew it wasn't going very good because she was watching the worst hundred storms of the worst hundred years on uh, the weather channel at the same time. So I kind of figured she wasn't really into listening to what we were doing. So when we left, 
another a &R person came up to me and she said, hey, I've got this new artist, Chris Young, and he's had three singles. They haven't done anything. If he doesn't have a hit single next time he's gone, would you write with him? So Corey's standing right there with me. And I said, yeah, if I can bring Corey. And she said, I don't care what you do as long as you get with Chris. So we didn't really know anything about Chris and he didn't know anything about us. And we got together and it was one of those days where nobody liked anybody else's ideas. And it was really stressful because one, it's hard enough to get to write with a rock, a recording star anymore or a recording artist even. And uh, two, if he doesn't have a hit single, he's gone. So we had to write him a hit single. So we kicked stuff around and nothing was going anywhere. And uh, so Corey is a spewer. I call him and Garth's kind of a spewer too. You can be working on a song and they'll be over in the corner when you take a break and they're writing another song. And so one day I was fixing Corey lunch and he was getting something out of the refrigerator and I heard him in the refrigerator sing, all I can think about is getting you home. And I said, what is that? He said, I just made that up. And I said, well, sing it into my voicemail. So uh, here we are with Chris, we don't have any ideas. And I said, hey, wait a minute, let me find this thing that Corey sang a while back. So I found that little snippet, no guitars, nothing, just the vocal. And I played it and Corey said, I love that idea. And I said, yeah, it's your idea. And Chris said, well, we don't have anything better to write. We might as well write it. So we ended up starting on writing that song and we got to the chorus and uh, we couldn't think of anything that rhymed with uh, door that was clean, you know? So finally I said, well, how about seeing her black dress hit the floor? And Corey said, well, you're just a dirty old man. I said, I won't argue that. And Chris said, I'm too young. I can't sing something like that. So we kicked around other ideas for like 30 minutes. And then I fixed them lunch. And I said, okay, you all think about it. So Corey said he was looking around my room and, you know, I had a number one song about standing in the kitchen with nothing but an apron on and ain't getting, ain't going down. It's kind of risque. And he said, you know, Chris, he's had pretty good luck with risque songs. And Chris said, well, we ain't got anything better to do. Let's put that in there. So we put that line in there and we finished the song that day and Chris did a guitar vocal in my studio and uh, he took it down to the record label and they called me and said, well, we love this song. We want to cut it on Chris. And I'm like, great. So the next week they called, they said, we cut the song. We love it. We want it to be his first single, but we want to change one thing. And I was kind of wondering, okay, what do they want to change? And they said, well, we love the title getting you home, but in parentheses, we want to call it the black dress song. So I thought, well, the dirty old man got vindicated that his, his line got in the title of the song. And I think it's kind of like selling aprons. I think there were a whole lot of people that got black dresses after that. So that's a good thing. <laughs> you're going to have to open up a clothing store with just aprons and black dresses. Now, there you go. See, you're an entrepreneur. You're a creative spirit. <laughs> It'd probably go good in uh, Dallas, you know. Yeah. Well, oh, man. Gosh. <laughs> Yeah, I, well, I, I know, can't do retail, Kent. <laughs> everybody's cooking these days. So, you know, aprons may be, you know, back in style. You never know. They could be. All right. And speaking of Ain't Going Down Till the Sun Comes Up, that was my next song on my list. That's do, a good do, I, do I want to know the story behind that song? Well, yeah, it's, it's really great because um, Garth had introduced me to Kim Williams and the three of us had started writing together. And like I said earlier, Garth likes to write from titles. And he called me up one day and said, I want to write a song with machine gun lyrics. I didn't have a clue what that meant, but I said, okay, well, come on by. And he said, call Kim Williams, tell him to come over. So we got together and he had this title, ain't going down till the sun comes up. And he said, if we write this right, it's going to be the first single off my next record. And I'm going to fly through the air in Dallas on a wire while I'm singing it. And I think this guy's delusional, you know, but I had moved into uh a house that had sat vacant for a year and a half. And so a lot of work was getting done on it. So we went out and sat on the back porch and we just wrote machine gun lyrics all day and laughed. We had such a good time because it was all in so much fun writing with those two guys. And finally we were all really sunburned from being out there all day. And so we kind of had a whole outline of the song and Bar said, well, I want to put a, a, a little guitar vocal down of it so I can show it to my producer. And, so we went in and I didn't have a lot of my studio set up yet, but Garth wanted a drum machine on it. 
And back then, drum machines were really bad, especially if it's a guitar player programming a drum machine, because then it sounds like a guitar player playing drums, which is not a good thing. And so I got the drum machine going, and Kim and Garth were standing behind me, and one of them went, oh my God. And I turned around and there were termites coming out of the floor and the ceiling and the wall, like thousands of them. And I guess the drum machine pissed them off. That's all I can say. And so I was freaking out because it's my new house and it has a letter that says you have no termites and here's millions of them. And so Kim Williams had the greatest sense of humor and he said, hey, don't worry about it. When Garth and I wrote Papa Love Mama, there were cockroaches crawling all over my apartment and it was a number one record. And this is gonna be a number one record too. And he was right. And Garth flew across the Dallas stage singing it hanging from a wire. So oh, uh, I've got some mice crawling around in my ceiling up there. Maybe we could I'll, I'll just grab a little. Her name is Reba, my guitar over there. Yeah, we could grab her and then we can write a hit. So this will anyway, I got to throw my cat up there at some point. But um, <laughs> <laughs> got to find a hole, put her in it take care of it yeah, very quickly yeah um all right let's move on to uh your latest album authentic the title track is authentic right and so i i take it you have an appreciation for people that are authentic, authentic. yeah that's you know we were talking about earlier i just don't see the authentic like i saw it back i mean you knew what haggard was you know what george jones was you know, they weren't putting on any kind of act. They weren't trying to be something. Uh, it was just real. And um, I was just kind of making a statement on how I would like things to be and what I appreciate, you know, who I go back to listen to. And it's it's what you feel is real. And everybody, of course, has their own opinion on it. But to me, there's just the people that you know when you hear them, they're authentic. And then the other ones that are kind of posers. Can you tell? After, with all your experience in the industry, can you tell when someone isn't being authentic? I can a lot of times, you know, I can tell when they've made something up just because they hope, know it'll be commercial or they know it'll be, you know, received by whoever they want it to be received to without really thinking, you know, what's this song gonna be like in 20 years? Am I gonna have to sing this song in 20 years? I mean, I think you could sing it tomorrow never comes the rest of your life, but there's some other ones like I won't mention any names that do you really want to be singing this when you're 60 years old in front of an audience, you know? And so that to me is what authentic is things that hold up over time. The picture on the cover is of a 1920 Martin guitar that was totally destroyed. And a friend of mine put it back together for me. And those were all handmade, you know, these days, most guitars are made on some kind of assembly line, but back then the guitar that's on the picture, there are only, I think 40 of them made that year. Wow. And so, you know, they make 40 guitars an hour anymore. So that to me is another authentic thing. You know, it's real, it's real wood. It's, uh, it's held the test of time and that's authentic to me. It's awesome. I, sh I really enjoyed that song too, Rose. That one almost made me cry. Just even like, yeah. you know, they may call me, uh, what was the lyric? Um, Martin, but yeah, you can call me Rose. Yeah, that, that was the one I wrote about her. And yeah. it's all a true story about, you know, how uh, she was junk. She was left for junk and a friend of mine fixed her up and now she's beautiful again. That's nice. Um, so I, uh, going back to the uh, authentic though, um, I've heard some artists in the past um, talk about when they first became recording artists and that they, um, the, the label wanted them to, uh, be something that they weren't right and um, and then when they got the chance to actually be themselves is whenever they started making you know hit records so do you do you have any insight into why labels sometimes try to get artists to portray themselves in an unauthentic way well the one thing I see is like when something's working in the music business they try to get everybody else to kind of clone it to get kind of the same crowd maybe. And um, so what happens is they'll sign somebody that they think have, has a lot of talent. And I've had this happen to two or three friends of mine in the, even the last couple of years. And they sign them for one thing. And then all of a sudden they just kind of start changing the agenda. You know, you have to 
write with these people or you have to cut your hair different or you know you have to start singing this kind of thing and i've had a few young people actually walk away from the deals that they had because they couldn't be who they wanted to be and it to me it seems more prevalent now than it used to be and i think part of that is if you don't have a hit song right away on the radio you're gone where like you know 15 years ago kenny chesney probably would have been gone after his first record but they let him develop in the Kenny Chesney. And I don't see that development much anymore unless they're pushing you to be what they want you to be. But the greatest time in music to me was like from mid sixties to mid seventies where nobody told the artist what to do. They were just who they were. And because of that, you had all this incredible music that didn't sound like anything else like Jimi Hendrix and the Beatles and whoever else. And, uh, my favorite story about that is when Garth was on uh, Capitol Records and Jim Fogelson was the president, he signed Garth and then he left right after that and a new president came in who was like probably the most powerful person in Nashville. And he had Garth out to his house and they had dinner and he told Garth, you're going to have to fire your management and fire your producer and I'm going to start producing you and I'm going to find you management. And most artists these days would go, okay, I'll do that. You know, whatever it takes to keep my record deal. And Gar said, no, sir, I can't do that. And he stayed with who he was. Wow. And I think he won that guy's respect because of that. And he did it his own way. And that's why he became Garth Brooks because he stood up for what he believed in. He didn't let anybody else try to make him anything but who he wanted to be. Do you think that maybe artists now are just so, um, I don't want to say afraid, but um, they don't want to rub people the wrong way. They just don't have that kind of courage, perhaps. Well, yeah, it's so hard to get a record deal. And even friends of mine uh, from maybe 10 years ago or whatever who had record deals and and now they don't, you know, they just basically said, I, I was so scared of losing my record deal that I would do anything they told me to do. And in the end, they end up losing their record deal anyway. So it's kind of a catch 22. And that's why I tell every young artist that I work with, make your first album be something you're really proud of because you may not get a second chance. And do you want to be looking at that album 10 years ago and uh, 10 years later and going, man, I wish I'd done it this way. Or I wish I'd done it that way. I wish I'd been who I really was. And um, that's what it's all about. That's the authenticness of being able to stand up for who you are and you lay your career on the line because of it. Mm -hmm. All right, and faith stronger than fear. Okay, so I was writing with Garth the day that uh, they blew up the Oklahoma City thing. I still, I still wow. get a moment about it. Yeah. And so it, his mom called him up and said, they blew out the windows in my house. Oh my God. And so Garth said to me, he said, I got to leave. I'm going to Oklahoma. Yeah. And so I got together with uh, a guy who was an unknown songwriter at the time, Craig Wiseman. And I had this idea that I wanted to write about the Oklahoma thing. And it was Faith Stronger Than Fear. And I wanted to pitch it to Garth. And so I thought we'd written a really good song and I pitched it to him and he was thinking about cutting it. And then Tony Arata came out with this great song that he pitched to Garth called The Change, which blew my song out of the water. But Faith stronger than fear. Every time something would happen, like 911 or the COVID that's going on now, every time that song would come back to me, it's like things keep repeating themselves, you know, yeah. and I need to get that song out there. So that was one of the old songs that I pulled out to get on the album because I thought everybody needed to, to hear that we got to have faith stronger than fear. And, you know, I get so many comments on it. People think it's a new song, but it's been you know, around since Oklahoma bombing and 911 and all that. So um, I'm really glad it finally got out there. And um, and that song is definitely a testament to um, to the, the next song, Sun's Gonna Shine Again. Yep. And, you know, that's another, I wanted this album to be, uh, give people hope and give people a possibility of what's coming after this. And so this was another old song and it had kind of been a bluegrass song coming from Kentucky. And uh, I just thought it was a good closing song on the record to give people a possibility of 
hey, when we get through this, the sun's going to shine again, you know, and I know everybody thought it would be over with by now, but, uh, you know, we just got to keep hanging in there and do everything we can and work together to get through this together. Absolutely. What other songs from that album do you want to talk about? Well, my favorite one is the one that starts the record, um, thanks to you, and that's because um, I have this place where I walk my dogs every day. It's a little lake here in Nashville. When you come, I'll take you there. But you can't tell anybody I took you there. Okay. Um, and uh, so there was, I was walking one day and this guy came up to me and he said, you stole my dog. And I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, That's my dog. You got my dog. And so uh, this little white dog had been a rescue dog. So I'm thinking, well, maybe it was his dog at one time. And so I said, well, he is a rescue dog, you know, and he said, oh, no, mine died, but he looks just like him, you know. And so um, <laughs> every once in a while, I'd see him out there and he's like, you stole my dog, you know, ha, ha, ha. And so then I didn't see him for like six months. And uh, one day I saw him and I said, man, where you been? He said, well, my wife's dying of a brain tumor. Oh, no. And I said, my wife died of a brain tumor. My goodness. And so I said, if there's any way I can help you, you know, and I didn't see him for like another year. Mm. And then he was out there and I could tell his wife died, you know. And so I said, man, you know, here's my number. Here's my name. Call me. He, we didn't know each other. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, who are you anyway? And he said, well, I'm Steve Allen. And I said, well, what do you do? He says, I'm a guitar player. Wow. So he had been in this hit group 2020 in the eighties and had been on American bandstand in the whole bit, but I didn't know who he was. And so I said, well, let's start writing together. And so I had this idea and I wanted to uh, have him be the one who wrote it with me because it was about starting a new life. And we both have new wives that are incredible. And, you know, uh, it's just more amazing than I can imagine. And so we were writing a song and when we got it done, I thought, I'm ready to do a record. And this song was kind of the reason that I did the record. And so this little white dog created miracles, you know? Wow. That's incredible. All right. Well, hopefully this part won't, won't make you cry. <laughs> On a very happy note, 2020 Nashville Songwriters Hall of Fame nominee. Woo what? I know, uh, amazing. very amazing, very honored. Uh, you know, when you come to town, you dream of that, but you know, there's, I think there's only like 200 people in there or whatever, you know, Jeez. so the possibilities always seem pretty limited, but I had some pretty powerful people in my corner pushing for that. So, uh, it was quite an honor to get that call and it really made 2020 be a lot more special than it would have been otherwise. Absolutely. So what did you, what did you do when you, when you heard the news? Well, what happened was um, I got a call from Mark Ford, who is the head of the National Songwriters Association. And he said, Garth wants to have this show for the billboard show that he's got coming up. And he wants you to put together a little in the round of some writers and we need to talk about it. So um, why don't you think about it and we'll get on a Zoom call with him and, and talk about it. So we get on the Zoom call and we're talking about this show and all that. And he gives me the date and I said, you know, every time you call me to do something and you give me a date, I always have something going on. And he said, well, it's not about that anyway. It's about you being in the Songwriters Hall of Fame. So it was cool that he was the one who wanted to break the news to me. That's amazing. And I think he cried more than I did. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he's more emotional than I am, I think. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and it, it was just such a happy time. My wife was out working in the garden and I texted her and I said, you got to come in and and hear this. So Garth got to tell her too. And um, next, I guess, November of this year, we'll do, hopefully with COVID gone, we'll do a, a big party about it. And there'll be two years together instead of the one, because we couldn't do anything last year because you can't gather anybody together. But I, at least, you know, it's I'm in there and it's going to happen. I got to wonder if Bobby Gentry is going to show up. Oh, I hope so. I mean, that was such an honor. What an amazing artist she was, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, it would be just a thrill to me to meet her and Steve Earle, you know, he's been one of my favorite for a long time. And he's one of these people that just keeps creating no matter what, which I love. And, uh, so it, it's going to be a fun time. So have you celebrated it all yet? We have just a little bit, you know, um, Garth had us out to the house a couple 
days later to have dinner and kind of celebrate with Bob Doyle, who kind of started the whole thing. And, um, and then Cindy and I, uh, we celebrate every day, you know, we kind of make a little toast to Hall, songwriter hall of fame and being healthy and happy and all that kind of thing. So just kind of planting that seed every day. Now, I don't know, um, how those ceremonies work. Like if, um, if you have to be invited to like attend at all, um, like to just see it happen. So have you, have you been to see anybody else get inducted? Yeah, I have been. And you know, they, they usually have it in a pretty big ballroom where anybody can buy tickets. I think the first tickets go to publishers and songwriters and stuff like that. But when they have, uh, tickets left over, anybody can, can buy tickets. And I think it usually seats like 1500 people or something like that. So yeah, there's a possibility of you coming. Mm-hmm. Hey, don't tempt me. Go. I, I will, I will expense that. Um, do you have your speech prepared? I don't. <laughs> I figured I have time, you know, with, <laughs> you have uh, a little bit of time. Being a later year, but you know, I, I kind of start tossing some things around in my mind and, and, uh, you know, just, it'll kind of be about if one thing hadn't happened, the next thing wouldn't have happened. That leads to the next thing happening. And, you know, mm-hmm. that synchronicity, that God wink or whatever that, that keeps you going. And, um, when you're about ready to give up and, you know, certain people in certain places change your life forever. So that's kind of what it's going to be about. Absolutely. Are you moving on to just for fun? All right. Let's say you're driving, you get pulled over cause you went, you know, one mile over the speed limit. It can happen. Right. right? Mm-hmm. Cause you, you wouldn't go like 15 over or anything. Surely not. But no. no. Do you bring up like songs that you've written to the police officer? And if you do, does it get you out of a ticket? Well, hello, pupper. There's a dog. No, I have not. But that's a good idea. I'm lucky that I don't get pulled over very often. So uh, um, one time I was pulled over. I had a guitar in the back. And so that kind of worked in my favor because they were, I I guess, you know, it it was late at night and I'd been playing in a club and they figured, well, anybody who's leaving a club had to be drinking. Well, I don't drink when I play. And so they pulled me over and, you know, made me walk the white line and take a breath test or whatever. And they said, well, you, you haven't been, you don't have any alcohol in your system. And I said, no, I play in a club. And he said, how can you play in a club and not drink? And I said, well, I'm a guitar player. There's my guitar right there in the back. And so he let me go. And that that was probably the best thing. I, I didn't talk about hit songs, but I just talked about, I'm a guitar player. I don't drink when I play. And amazing. Yeah. I don't think I could walk the white line sober. Like I, I don't I know, have the coordination. It's tough. You know, there's a lot of pressure. You're kind of scared, you know, mm-hmm. you're kind of trying to do real good. And it, it is, it's weird. Your adrenaline's going and, <laughs> but I did it. So that's good. Good work. <laughs> what are some of your favorite places in Nashville? Well, I have to say the Bluebird Cafe uh, is my favorite just because of all the wonderful things gigs that I've had there and, and Garth getting the record deal signed from there. And it's just the place that's known around the world as a haven for songwriters. And there's very few of those. There's more now than there ever was, I think. But um, a- any chance I get, I try to go there and hear what's happening. We- we've done an live hospice show for probably 25 years. Every January, the Bluebird donates all the money to hospice. And so this year, not being open. They've really been trying to get around it other ways and having streaming shows and stuff like that. And I just go more power to them for trying to keep that whole thing alive during the middle of this whole Mm -hmm. pandemic that we have. The other favorite place is uh, where I'm going to take you to the lake um, when you come, but you can't tell anybody because it used to be there was nobody there. And due to COVID, I think we've had 2.2 2.2 million people there this year. Oh my gosh. Cause everybody's trying to get outside. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so it's kind of weird to be out here at this park, but you always, you got to wear masks and everything else. Cause there's so many people out there. So I've been trying to find some new places. And then I love brewing guitars because I love old guitars and I have some friends of mine that work there. So back when you could go hang there, I would go hang there. And also Walter Carter's is another great vintage guitar place in Nashville. And I just love seeing old instruments, you know, they all have a story to tell and some of the most battered and beaten ones have the best stories to them. So those are some of my favorite places to hang out and country music hall of fame. I take everybody who comes to town to there 
just to see the history of country music and the great exhibits they have. And they have great halls. I, I do a lot of shows down there and the acoustics are always great. The audience is always great. So it's, it's a, a must see for anybody who comes to town. Absolutely. Tell me about a time when you were starstruck. Well, I think my favorite time was uh, the guy who signed me to BMI and who was very influential in getting me to move to town was a guy, Harry Warner. And Harry, uh, his best friend was Chet Atkins. Oh, okay. Okay, so they hung out together all the time. And I really wanted to meet Chet. And so I'd gotten this old Gretsch guitar that had, uh, it was called the Chet Atkins model and had had his fake autograph, you know, on the pick guard or whatever. And so I wanted Chet to sign it. And so Harry said, well, we get together every Saturday at Cracker Barrel and we eat. And so just come on by with that guitar and I'll get Chet to sign it. So uh, we get there and there's like a table for 10 and there's me and Harry and Chet are there and we're talking and this guy sits across from me and I look up and it's Sonny Landreth, who is my favorite slide guitar player in the world. And then this other guy sits next to me and I look around and it's Mark Knopfler, who was in dire straits. And I'm going, this is unbelievable. You know, oh, well, here, I here's some of my favorite <laughs> people in the world and they're, uh, they're all sitting here at Cracker Barrel, you know, but they were all huge <laughs> Chet fans. And so they all wanted to be around Chet. And so I got to have Chet sign my guitar, but also got Sonny Landreth and, and uh, Mark Knopfler to sign the guitar. So that was pretty cool too. That is wild. All right, so let's say you get a good hit on the radio, you get your nice check. How do you treat yourself? <sighs> Let me think. <laughs> <laughs> I think, uh, you know, at this point in time, with uh, not being able to travel for so long, I think that's what we would do is, is find some fabulous trip to go on and treat ourselves to being landlocked for a year and a half or whatever. Like where, what's on your, uh, what's on your bucket list for travel? Um, we'd love to go back to Italy. We went there a couple of years ago and had a great time. And, uh, in France, there's a lot of, uh, of the, uh, national parks that we want to get to. We were supposed to do a park city, uh, Utah festival this year that got canceled. And we were going to go to all the monuments out there in uh, Bryce Canyon and stuff like that while we were out there. So maybe we'll aim for that this year too. I think they're going to try to have it again this year if everybody gets healthy again. And so we'll go out there and just do some things in America too. All right. I got a few more fun questions and mm -hmm. then uh, we'll be just about done. All right. I don't know why I asked this question to people, but it's just, I'm fascinated by the response. So who's your celebrity crush? Boy, that's a tough one. I'll, I'll tell you, I watch so little Netflix and TV or whatever. <laughs> I'm you don't go even know Reba. who's out there. Yeah, I don't know who's out there, but I'd have to go with Reba McIntyre. You're talking really? about that. I just saw her on the CMA Awards, and she was still fabulous. And isn't she? And uh, she put a couple songs of mine on hold uh, last month that are ten years old that are pretty country. And I thought, go Reba. You know, That's maybe awesome. she could go back country again, which she's fabulous at that. So, you know, she's just always so positive, so perky, and. Uh, she doesn't let anything stop her. And I love that. Absolutely. What's the worst thing you did as a kid? How much time do you have? <laughs> Got all, as much time as you're willing to spend. <laughs> um, I think probably the, the worst thing in, in my mind is, so have you ever seen the movie Christmas Story where the kid wants the BB gun? Yeah. And he gets the BB gun. Yeah. So, Don't shoot your eye out. That's right. So that was my mother. You're going to shoot your eye out. So, um, I got a BB gun for Christmas and it was kind of like Nashville is right now in Lexington. We had a really bad snowstorm. And, uh, so I took my BB gun outside and, um, I shot a snowman I'd made. Well, I didn't realize that everything had frozen the night before. So the BB bounced off the snowman and knocked out the back window of my dad's car. So that was kind of the end of my BB gun for a while. And, uh, you know, it's like, how did that happen? I don't know. I never thought that it would bounce off a snowman and end up taking a window out. But I learned that day, you got to be careful where you, got, you aim anything. You got a physics lesson that day. I did, yeah. 
<laughs> What's the riskiest or most adventurous thing you've ever done? Whew. You know, I really think coming to Nashville because um, there's so many people that I know that are way more talented than me back in Lexington, Kentucky or anywhere else that never could get up the nerve to come to Nashville, Tennessee. And so anybody that moves to Nashville, any young artist I'm talking to or whatever that are thinking about it, I say, you got to be crazy to move to Nashville to think that you can compete with everybody else that's already been there. But if you don't, you're going to live the rest of your life going, what if I had gone to Nashville? What would have happened? Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the most risky thing. You're, you're risking your whole life to go crazy, chase some crazy dream, you know, and your parents were hoping you'd be an accountant or a lawyer or a doctor. And instead it's like, Hey, I want to become a songwriter. Or I want to become a singer. And, uh, it takes a lot of nerve to stand up for that and chase that dream. And, you know, I'd say 90% of the people that come, it doesn't happen for them, but still they took the chance and every mm -hmm. once in a while magic and miracles come together and, and somebody becomes famous or becomes a hit songwriter or whatever, but it's just risky. And most of us come to town with little money in our pockets and no jobs and just pursuing that dream, whatever it's mm -hmm. going to take. Yeah, we know when I was moving, um, I'm originally from Arkansas, like like a tiny town called Smackover, Arkansas. Like, wh and whatever your <laughs> thoughts you're having right now, you're right. But yeah. um, I, I moved here to Dallas like as soon as I could after college. And I had like $400 in my pocket. I had a truck. Hey. I had a place to stay for a while. I was like, all right, let's just make it work. Yeah, and that, that's, uh, that takes a lot of courage, you know, and it takes a lot of belief in yourself that you're going to make it happen. So congratulations to you. Look where you are. Yeah. <laughs> Even with mice in the ceiling, you know. Yeah, that's just, it's because my husband feeds the birds. He likes feeding birds and squirrels. And so we got a whole ecosystem here. And that's why we got a cat and it's just a zoo. But <laughs> Yeah, put him up there for a while. Right. Well, I, the next question was going to be, when is the last time you cried and why? But that was roughly 15 <laughs> minutes ago. So yeah. I can move on. To <laughs> that would be me, yeah. I'll just move on to, what is the, big, the biggest compliment you could re ever receive? Your song changed my life. Wow. That's something you dream of from the time you start writing, you know, to have impact on people to write songs that are going to touch their hearts and their minds and their souls. And for somebody to say that, it's like, thank you, universe, for allowing me to be there. That's wonderful. All right, Kent, moving on to Could You Not. So go ahead and put it out there, whether it's professional or personal or traffic related or just something with the dog. I don't care. What is it? Just tell the world, could you not? Could you not be a new writer artist and show up at a writing appointment with no guitar, no idea, no computer, no lyric pad, anything. You just show up and expect that somebody else is going to do it. Be Could prepared. you not do that? Pre being prepared is the most important thing to having anybody want to work with you again. That, that, I mean, it makes sense. It's like going to a job interview with like no no idea what you're doing there. No, you don't even know what the company does. Exactly. Yeah. What, what good's that going to do you? Mm-hmm. Okay. Moving on to why in the Sam Hill did we say that? So I'll give you, I'll give you a couple options here. If you want, I have okay. Sam Hill uh -huh. and I've got a country mile. Yeah. How far is a country mile? Well, but, you know, my favorite one, I think uh, that when you said that is holy cow, what's a holy cow. You know, I wonder How if that's, about? I wonder if that has anything to do with, um, with India, because I believe it's in Hindu in the Hindu religion, right. they, they worship cows. That would be a whole, yeah, they don't, they won't kill them because it may be their relative. There is something like that. Holy cow. All right. A country mile, according to grammarist.com, a country mile is a term that dates back to at least the 1800s. It is a deceptively long distance. The idea behind a country mile is the fact that most country roads are not in a straight line. Instead, roads in the country tend to meander up and down and all around. This makes it seem as if a mile in the country takes longer to cross than a, a straight mile in the city. That makes sense. I mean, if you've ever driven the winding roads of North Carolina or East Tennessee. Or smack over uh, Arkansas. It seems like a long way away. <laughs> all right, Kent, that is all I've got for you. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about before I let you go? No, you've done an amazing job. I love doing this. I'd love to do it again anytime you want. And if there's any way I can help you get other people, let me know. 
All right, Kent, that's all I've got. So um, I really do genuinely appreciate you coming on today, and um, hopefully we'll get this thing up in about a month. Okay, and I'm honored, and I hope you keep your power and that it warms up there like it's supposed to warm up here. Yeah, y'all stay warm out there. You too. All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh Bye-bye. Alrighty, folks, thanks so much for checking out this video. Got lots of more fun stuff coming up. Make sure you are subscribed to the channel and uh, give us a follow over on social media. Make sure you check out Kent's latest album. Thanks again, and we'll see you in the next episode.